All right, welcome back to Unit 4, Day 13. Remember, to have your address to your notebook out, and you're taking notes as you move to the video. And make sure you complete the vocabulary for this video, either highlighting it in your notes or writing it in your notebook somewhere. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to do the ABC Nations, Vargas, Juan Petron, Cardenas, El Pri, The Mexican Miracle, Fox, Pan, and Pinochet. We're going to talk about the development of the ABC Nations and Mexico after World War II and American involvement in Latin America. So from the 1914 to the 1940s, Latin America is going to really surge in World War I um, due to the upsurge in exports and developments of industries, due to those exports and things being needed for the war effort in Europe and other places in the world. But in the 20s and for through the 40s, the depression, like it does for the rest of the world, it's going to really hurt their local economics due to the decreased need of export goods. So three nations emerge as major players in South America, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina. Considering that their exports was their really their only economic value, it kind of sees that during the Great Depression that they're the big, biggest economies are going to survive better. Brazil will also join the allies of World War I, but the other two will remain neutral, thus benefiting Brazil and kind of somewhat hurting the other two. So let's start with Chile. Uh, Chile was predominantly a parliamentary government up until 1925, where then C Congress will overshadowed uh, the president. They're going to cling to their laissez-faire policies while economic problems mounted. While there was a reform movement that began to clamor for social reform and becoming more of a democracy and democratization, the military will stage a coup to avoid more radical reforms. And they, the military begins to appoint the presidents, but they were more conservative and they began to massacre and had many fights with leftists, right? And unions and unions, right? From 32 to 73, it's going to be a slow transition back to a, a more of a civil system of government, more of a democracy and more of, well, more of a Republican style democracy. And we're going to get back to Chile here in just a second. But I did talk about Brazil. Um, from the 1930s to the 19, to 1954, the old republic will, dom will be dominated by the wealthy landed elite. Their export energies will last until 1930s, and then they're going to start moving toward um, more finished goods and more kind of self kind of economy. Um, then we get a military coup in 1930, which will install Vargas as president. Vargas was ruled as a dictator. He has a he starts off as a dictator, but then he'll be a dictator, then he'll be elected president. Then over time people begin to kind of push back, he'll be a dictator again, right? And then after his time as a dictator, he'll give the reins back over to a Republican democracy, and then he'll be a senator within that Republican democracy. Um during his time in power, he will take aspects from popularism, fascism, cult of personality, and liberalism, and really kind of try to blend this kind of economic style. And he will continue the industrial and agricultural growth with the development and destruction of the Amazon. So Brazil will kind of go through like a, like very much of a governmental shift over the years. So let's... Now, Chile, we said up until 1973, was trying to kind of return back to that kind of liberal um, kind of Republican democracy. In this, we get Pinochet. Now, this is Augusto Pinochet. He will be a dictator of Chile from 73 till 1990. And the thing is, in Latin America, the United States will intervene a lot, right? Especially to overthrow groups that are against their interests. So Pinochet is one of those dictators that gets put in power after a U.S.-backed coup against the socialist government of Linde, right? He's going to support economic liberalization, more trade with the United States, um, and his economy of Chile will grow, but so will the disparity in uh, difference of like rich and poor. After he leaves, during his time period, he's going to steal $28 million, and he'll be promptly arrested after the presidency. Pinochet is very much of a poster child of the common Latin American dictator, uh, where he comes to power to the United States, but he's extremely corrupt and can't really uh, support and is gets arrested afterwards. 
Let's talk about Argentina from 1960 and 1930s. We have more middle class radical parties are going to win the presidency, but the conservatives will control the parliaments. Radicals sought to expand the electorate, democracy, and benefit the middle class, while the conservatives were maintained on the rich and making money for the whole economy. Now, in the 1930s, right, during the, during the height of the Great Depression, it did have the fourth largest per capita GDP in 1928. But it will cripple, the Great Depression will cripple its foreign trade. And we're going to have clashes between the rising and new fascist parties in the 30s, socialist, communists, unions and management. It's just this constant kind of fighting and kind of just, it becomes extremely unstable. Now, by 1943, a military coup, coup by the military uh, will create a junta in, in 1943 to avoid getting into World War II. So Argentina was on the er, on the cusp of joining the Allies in World War II, but a coup and a ruling junta will become will keep them out of World War II. The junta becomes dominated by a gentleman by the name of Juan Perón, uh, who becomes president in 1946. He is going to become extremely uh, he's going to mix populism, fascism, socialism, dictatorship, and create a cult of personality. He'll censor the press and expand participation to unions and spending on more social problems. Um, he's going to follow an isolationist foreign policy and attempted to limit others' economic influence. So he really wants to make Argentina self-sufficient. Now, his wife, Evita, will help him and the government become more of a darling to the shirkless workers. She is extremely influential in, in helping grow the, the kind of support for Juan Peron in Argentina and will eventually lead Ar Argentina to somewhat of prosperity by the 50s. Now, let's move to Mexico. Now, in the 20th century, in the 19 teens, in the early 20th century, we have the rise of Cardenas. Now, Cardenas are going to act sweeping reforms. He's going to nationalize the oil industry, which was largely which was largely owned by the United States, which will bring massive, massive amounts of money back into Mexico. He's going to um, give land to the Indians and poor farmers, right? And he's going to be, for the most part, extremely kind of helpful for Mexico. Now, we have the rise of the Industrialized Revolutionary Party, or the PRI, um, or El PRI. Um, so, and they're going to maintain the pattern for politics until 1995. So they're going to ally the, Mex the Mexican state to money interest, and they are an exceedingly corrupt. They're going to ally wealthy industrialists with, with the rising urban middle class interest. It, this is going to move the PRI to be more conservative, and they're going to they're going to steal much of the PAN's political ideology, right? They're going to, as we talked about before, they're going to woo foreign capital. They're going to negotiate massive loans from the United States, which will unfortunately cause the United States to have more of an interest in Mexico, right? But due to this, they're going to accelerate uh, industrialization at the expense of the poor, royal, and even Indians and workers, right? So the PRI is going to be this kind of party until the 1995 and even until today but it's, but its prominence in today's world is largely diminished right now the first four decades of the pri are dubbed the mexican miracle this is a time period where we have a sex tuppling of the um or times six to their economy this is a period of rapid economic economic growth we have the Substitution of imports, low inflation, it's going to be spurred national development plans, right? The GDP, again, will will increase by six times. Population will only double, and the dollar-peso parity will maintain, meaning that the dollar and the peso will be fairly equal, as uh, unlike today, where the dollar is worth 19 to 20 pesos, Right? And Mexico during this time period will go from a largely rural economy to an industrial society with oil production and massive wealth coming into the country. Now, the PRI will lose its monopoly on power. And because it's accused several times of blatant fraud, and but it's it's one of those where they're accused of stealing, um, 
elections and taking corruption and bribes and things to put people in a certain power. In the 1980s, the PRI will lose its first state governorship, and we have Presidential Vindicte Fox Quisada, right, who's a member of the uh, National Action Party or the PAN, right? And due to the like corruption and the loss of people's support for the PRI, um, this is going to allow Quisada to win in 2000. This election in its 71 years of uh, PRI uh, hegemony of the presidency, right? And it's and it, but it's kind of that really the shift away from one political party to now multiple political parties, right? Then we have President President Felipe Calderon, Hidalgoza, right? And Calderon was also a member of the conservative National Action Party of Pan. Um, now, many people do claim that he does steal the election, uh, that he did actually win the election, and his his opponent, Obrador, will actually um, claim that he won. He's a member of the Party of the Democratic Revolution. He claimed that he won, and he'll actually kind of split the government some way by claiming to be a government in exile and kind of try to run the government through that. Again, it's just this end of, like, political hegemony or the political like sameness in the early in the late 20th century to early 2000s right now let's talk about the united states in uh, latin america known as the american empire the united states will will remain and still does remain the greatest external force in latin america right there will be there will be more than 30 interventions of americans before 1933 Right, the U.S. is going to invest it heavily, loan billions of dollars in Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean, and when, whenever they, the Americans in the United States, believe that their interests were to be threatened, they would intervene to make sure that their money was that was invested is saved. This is known as dollar diplomacy, right? And kind of, it's really kind of predatory, right? Um, in the 1930s, this is a big change. FDR, he's going to introduce the good neighbor policy, and he's going to try to help with Latin American interests um, and kind of support the Latin Americans more than just trying to rely solely on the support of the United States. Now, in the 60s and 70s, um, intervention was renewed in Latin America af after World War II in order to prevent communism. That containment policy, anytime a... Um, Latin American country even hinted at becoming socialist or communist. America intervened over through that government, right? By the late 70s and 80s, U.S. intervention was kind of on the decline. Uh, and also during this time, President Carter will sign a treaty returning Pan Panama Canal to Panama, right? But due to but Presidents Reagan and Bush Sr. will push more for aggressive policies in Latin America to contain communism. That is until the fall of the Soviet Union. So that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, make sure you're following along in your notes, and I'll see you guys in class. Thank